Should I sit down here or down there? Yes. Here or there? Buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a la conferencia de clausura del séptimo seminario internacional sobre el comportamiento y sus aplicaciones CINCA. Es un placer presentar al profesor Thomas Sental de la Universidad de Kentucky, quien amablemente accedió a presentar un panorama de su trabajo reciente en el séptimo seminario internacional sobre el comportamiento y sus aplicaciones CINCA. El profesor Sental es considerado uno de los fundadores del área de cognición comparada. Heredero de la tradición de Edward Tolman, ha tenido un papel determinante en el prestigio del que actualmente goza el área de cognición animal, que sin perder rigor científico, ha expandido los temas de investigación considerados aceptables por la psicología. Desde sus primeros años de investigación, ha tenido un gran interés en avanzar la comprensión de la cognición humana mediante el uso de modelos animales en especial pichones, pero también otras especies como ratas y perros. Podría decirles que Tom Sental es uno de los científicos más productivos en el área de cognición comparada, al ser editor de seis influyentes libros sobre el tema, autor de más de 300 artículos en importantes revistas como Science, Proceedings of the Royal Society of London, Psychological Science, Journal of Experimental Psychology, entre muchas otras, y por las más de 12.000 citas, que sus artículos han recibido. Pero yo prefiero enfocar la atención de ustedes al amplio rango de temas que sus trabajos han abordado y a la disposición de abordar nuevos temas con la única condición de que ello pueda hacerse con el alto rigor científico que caracteriza a sus investigaciones. Los trabajos del profesor Sental son una referencia obligada en temas tan diversos como la relación entre generalización de estímulos y la conducta compleja, la formación de conceptos en pichones, la capacidad de los pichones de realizar inferencias transitivas, atención dividida, olvido dirigido, el análisis del contenido de la memoria en pichones, eh, conducta social, particularmente imitación. ¿Sí? Eh, tomen al azar un libro de cognición comparada y encontrarán importantes estudios que han hecho que incremente nuestra comprensión de estos temas tan diversos. Su línea de investigación más reciente y sobre la cual nos hablará hoy se relaciona con un análisis comparativo de fenómenos cognitivos complejos que dan lugar a conducta maladaptativa, sesgos cognitivos y fallas en la racionalidad. Una de las características del trabajo de investigación del profesor Sental consiste en hacer un cuidadoso análisis de las variables relacionadas con el fenómeno cuando es visto en humanos y posteriormente ejerciendo un alto nivel de creatividad llevar lo esencial de dichos procesos a diseños experimentales con animales. 
todos estos estudios le han hecho acreedor a un importante lugar en los libros de historia de la psicología como uno de los fundadores del área de cognición animal. Es un placer presentar al profesor Tom Sental en su conferencia A Pigeon Model of Gambling Behavior. Eh, una vez más, quiero agradecer su disposición a visitar México y contarnos sobre su importante trabajo. ¿Sí? Eh, I want to thank you for your disposition to visit Mexico and for talking about your work. Thank you, Vladimir. Uh, I, I want to thank Felipe and the organizing committee for the honor of making this presentation uh, in this spot at the end of the meeting. It's been a really wonderful meeting. And I want to thank, especially thank Vladimir, who has been a wonderful host, uh, both in Mexico City and, in, and here. Um, he has been available to my wife and me all that time and has been delightful. I really appreciate that a lot. Um, the research I'm going to talk about today has been touched on back uh, on Wednesday. Many of you attended the symposium then, and it was an introduction to some of the more recent research on this topic of suboptimal choice. And uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, tell you something about my personal history with this problem, how it developed, and uh, where we think we are now, although some of that probably will need to be modified by the symposium on Wednesday. So uh, I'm going to be talking about pigeons and gambling behavior. This is, for those of you who don't work with pigeons, this is a picture of an operant chamber. And uh, this, is their, this is an old-fashioned one with three keys and a projector behind that can project colors and shapes. And here we have the opening for a feeder that can feed the pigeon when it's correct. Um, we started with a very different question. The question was not would pigeons choose suboptimally because we were told that pigeons would not choose suboptimally. When we talked to our biological friends, they told us that pigeons have evolved to be optimal foragers. And so if we give them a choice between less food and more food, they would always choose more food. Um, I don't think that's necessarily wrong now, but I think one has to modify that statement. It can't be a universal statement. Um, cognitive psychologists also told me that pigeons would not choose suboptimally because when humans choose suboptimally, it is generally for a different reason, that is, Humans will gamble, and when humans uh, tell you why they gamble, they say because it's fun. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but pigeons shouldn't be having fun. They should be working for food as hard as they can. <laughs> so our original question was much more limited. It was, would a pigeon prefer information even if the information was not useful in getting more food? I, tend to use cognitive terminology, but it's only uh, in a way to allow people to identify with the kind of um, processes that I'm talking about. But if you prefer not to, and many of you may be behavior analysts, that's fine. I don't have any trouble with that. Um, so if you don't like information, you can talk about uh, conditioned reinforcers being something that animals will choose when they have those options. So in our earliest experiment many years ago, um, oops, I went back. Uh, we have two response keys, left and right. Sometimes we use just a spatial discrimination. Sometimes you'll see that there's a shape on the key, and whenever you see that, it means that it can uh, vary from side to side if we're concerned about uh, spatial preferences. So we have two uh, keys, two white keys in this case, one on the left and one on the right. One we will call the informative key and the other the uninformative key. And 
here, is, here are the uh, alternatives that uh, occur. Well, I, I'm sorry, the, the uh, stimuli that may occur, either, either a green light or a yellow, uh, a red light. Um, if the green light occurs, it will always be followed in 10 seconds by reinforcement. And if the red light occurs, it will always be followed by the absence of reinforcement. And so there is 50% reinforcement on the left side. On the right side, there is also 50% reinforcement. Um, either it will be a blue light or a yellow light, and each of those lights will be followed by reinforcement 50% of the time. So the probability of reinforcement for either alternative will be 50%, and so in principle, there should be no preference for either side. But what we find is there is a very strong preference for what we call the informational side, or the side with discriminative stimuli. We uh, were a bit surprised about that, uh, the strong preference. And so we asked, uh, if the pigeon has to pay a penalty for making that choice, would it continue to do so? And uh, the first penalty we chose was to make two pecks instead of one. And the pigeon still preferred that side. Then we doubled it to four and to eight and to 16. And it was not until we got to 16 pecks on the informative side versus one peck on the uninformative side that the pigeons decided to switch over. Keep in mind that in order for the pigeon to make 16 pecks, it takes eight to 10 seconds for the pigeon to do that. And so we have a delay of reinforcement in addition to the extra effort. So we still have a strong preference for the information side. And this led us to the first of our experiments that deal with suboptimal choice. Would the pigeon prefer information over more food? And so in this experiment, we also had two keys, left and right. If the pigeon chose the left side, um, and by the way, all of these, uh, in all cases, I will refer to the left versus the right, and the left side is always the suboptimal side, but in fact, um, it was counterbalanced over pigeons, and the colors you see were also counterbalanced. So um, I use green because it's easy to remember that that's the go, that's the, the, the good side, the good stimulus. So um, under these conditions, there's a 20% chance that a green light will appear, and it will always signal food, and there's an 80% chance that a red light will appear, and it signals no food. On the uninformative side, we have a choice. Uh, we don't have a choice. We have either a blue light or a yellow light. Again, that's always followed by 50% reinforcement. And um, what's important here is the left side now has a 20% chance of reinforcement and the right side a 50% chance. Um, if the pigeons choose the left side, they get less food. In fact, they can get two and a half times as much food for choosing the right side. And here is the results of that experiment. Very quickly, we have um, a choice of the suboptimal alternative. And uh, you can see that they reach virtually 100% choice of that alternative. OK. Um, one possible explanation for this is that the Un the uninformative side also involves uh, uncertainty. That is, as you can see here, um, there's a 50% chance of reinforcement. And it's possible that the pigeons, when you have two choices, the, the pigeons can make a choice of one side, not because they have a strong preference for that side, but because they may be avoiding the other side, the side with um, where they're uncertain of the outcome of that alternative. So um, we followed up with this in this experiment with a question of whether probability could be replaced by magnitude of reinforcement in which the magnitude was a constant. And so in this experiment, we used pigeon pellets. And you can see that the green stimulus, when it appears, predicts uh, 10 pellets. This is, we can call this the jackpot. 
which is uh, very much analogous to gamblers when they win um, a high prize. Um, as before, uh, when the red light appeared, it signaled the absence of reinforcement. On the um, optimal side, um, you can see that uh, the number of pellets obtained over here um, is three no matter what. So you can look at this as pellets expected. On this side, it would be an average of two, and on this side, 50% more or three pellets um, independent of the color that appears. Uh, the colors are in the same ratio as on the left side in order to control for the frequency of each of these colors. But as you can see, the outcome is always exactly three pellets. And although here we have uh, the learning, and here we have, again, choice of the suboptimal alternative on the y-axis and number of sessions, and although the acquisition function is somewhat uh, slower, you can see that very quickly they begin to choose the um, gambling side, if you will, or the one with the uh, discriminative stimuli. So what we found that was unexpected and rather interesting is it appears that the green 20% reinforcement conditioned reinforcer has more positive value than it ought to have. That is, in a sense, winning is something you might say is very exciting, and um, that seems to drive this effect. But what is surprising is why doesn't the experience with the red on 80% of the trials, almost all the trials, where they get no reinforcement, um, one could consider it a conditioned inhibitor, why that doesn't deter the pigeon. And um, I can tell you from personal experience that playing a slot machine for about two minutes is sufficient to deter me from playing, from gambling. But um, I, I, I'm sure that problem gamblers uh, don't experience that. And in fact, what it looks like is that uh, getting that red light does, uh, uh, does not um, uh, impede the animals from making that choice. So the conditioned inhibitor appears to have very little negative va value. It doesn't um, get the animal to stop choosing it. So at this point, we had to conclude that the probability of a loss, that is the red light, is not important. And the only important outcome is the positive stimulus. And uh, we could say that the best color wins meaning the terminal link seems to determine, to a very large extent, the choice of the left side over the right. So um, this is a, a, a conclusion that's relatively um, indirect. And uh, we thought we could try to measure inhibition more directly. Um, and you can uh, assess that with a combined Q test or a summation test by presenting the presumed inhibitor together with a presumed exciter. In the case of colors, that probably isn't the appropriate thing to do because if you combine, if you put a red light on top of a green light, you get something that is um, another, a different color. So instead of doing that, we presented a black line on a white background as the stimulus associated with the absence of food. And now what we can do is ask to what extent, in a summation test, ask to what extent this black line will uh, re reduce pecking to the green light on probe trials that are inserted um, during a session. So we will present by itself, without prior choice, a green light or a green light with a black line on top of it. This is following this kind of training, and you'll see in a moment what that looks like. We also reduced the probability of reinforcement on the uh, optimal side for the purpose of slowing down the acquisition. So it would, we reasoned that it would take the pigeon longer to uh, show the effects, 
because what we are going to do is test the pigeon early in training and then later in training. The reasoning is that uh, early in training we would expect, in principle at least, to find relatively little conditioned inhibition, and later in training normally you would expect more conditioned inhibition because of extra experience with the stimuli. And so looking at the um, acquisition here, there are a couple of things that I should point out. Um, this is, again, present choice of the two-pellet alternative. And you can see that um, this red bar indicates the sessions where we included the probe trials. Um, and what's interesting about slowing it down is we see an additional interesting phenomenon, which is that initially the pigeons seem to prefer the optimal alternative. It's below 50% for several sessions, and then gradually it creeps up, and then this is our late measure of conditioned inhibition. And the results of this um, manipulation can be seen in the next slide, in which we are measuring pecs per trial um, early. And uh, the, uh, we have here the symbols that represent this is pecs per trial on uh, green alone probe trials, and pecs per trial on the green plus the presumed S minus, which is the vertical line. And you can see that there is a significant difference between the two, indicating that the presence of the vertical line now um, reduces pecking to that um, compound. And when we looked at this later in training, what we found was most of that difference went away. There's no longer a significant difference that uh, clearly there is a reduction in inhibition um, from early to late in training. And this makes intuitive sense um, because the pigeons are now um, no longer avoiding the left side and they're preferring the right side um, because the uh, vertical line is no longer inhibiting. It is, has become virtually neutral. Now, I should mention that uh, those of you who were here on Wednesday heard a very nice talk um, by Aaron Blaisdell um, looking at uh, conditioned inhibition using some somewhat different stimuli, and he found something quite different from this. Notice that here we have a negative correlation between the um, effectiveness of the conditioned inhibitor and the preference for the alternative, uh, the suboptimal alternative. Um, what Aaron found was the opposite. He found that uh, condition inhibition seemed to increase, and um, it was associated with a parallel increase in um, the choice of the suboptimal alternative. Um, that is a puzzle to me, and to him I suspect as well. How can you get a preference for a side that produces a stimulus that's becoming more and more inhibitory? Um, that needs to be resolved in some way. Uh, it may have something to do with the, the interesting stimuli that he presented, pairs of stimuli either in horizontal or vertical display. I don't know. Anyway, that's uh, something that I've learned from coming to Cinco. Okay, so if that's true, then the implication of that is that the pigeon is actually not choosing between 20% and 50% reinforcement, it's really choosing between 100% and 50% reinforcement. Why it is is not clear, but this seems to be uh, an implication of this line of, of research. Similarly, in the other experiment that I discussed, um, it's really not that the pigeon is choosing between two pellets, an average of two pellets, and three pellets, the animal is choosing between 10 pellets and three pellets for whatever reason. Um, so the hypothesis is that it's not the value of the choice, but the value of the positive stimulus 
given that it occurs. It's the reward value for some reason. Okay. So we followed this up with an experiment. Um, Valeria uh, uh, did something like this, and she presented some data on this in um, the symposium on Wednesday. And um, the question here is, this: I would consider this a strong test of the hypothesis. So what we have here is we still have a difference of 0.2 versus 0.5 in terms of the probability of reinforcement. But now notice the probability of getting the green is 0.2 and the red is 0.8, but the probability of getting blue is 0.5 and yellow is 0.5, but now we have discriminative stimuli on both sides, okay? So although the blue one occurs two and a half times as much as the green one, the probability of reinforcement signaled by the green and signaled by the blue is exactly the same. So if we are right, and the probability of reinforcement associated with the choice stimuli, these two stimuli, is really not important, then these, the alternatives should provide indifference. They shouldn't care because they can get a green stimulus that signals 100% reinforcement on one side and a blue stimulus that signals 100% reinforcement on the other side. And surprisingly, the results of this experiment indicate that the pigeons are indifferent. The percent choice, the low probability alternative, is essentially 50%. Um, this is still suboptimal because optimal choice would be down at zero. They should choose the optimal alternative all, this, all the time. Now, another thing that I learned at this meeting on Wednesday, Valeria presented some very nice research in which she manipulated the probabilities of reinforcement associated with the two alternatives. Let's see if I can go back here. Yeah. So she manipulated these probabilities. We just used the two, 20% and 50%, but she manipulated it within subject. So it was a repeated measures design. And what she found was it does make a difference. When you hold the, um, the probability of reinforcement associated with the two positive stimuli, in this case, the green and the blue, you do get an effect of the probability of reinforcement associated with the two initial stimuli. Now, this is another uh, problematic finding, although because it's a within subject design, it may well be that when you transfer from one set of probabilities to another, there may well be a kind of positive transfer or, or contrast effect. You may get um, some contrast between these probabilities and this would be something that we would have to uh, follow up on in some way because this is a between groups design that showed this very nice effect. Okay, um, so another approach to this is to uh, take a uh, procedure that was, I guess, first described uh, by Kendall, then by Fantino, then by Spetch's lab, and also by Maser using uh, schedules of reinforcement. We tend to use um, single responses. But um, we borrowed this procedure because we felt that it would be a good test of our theory, which is that it is not the initial link that determines preference, but the terminal link stimuli. And here you can see under conditions in which there is a 50%, we're using 50% reinforcement versus 100, there's a 50% chance of getting a green stimulus followed by reinforcement all the time. But on the optimal side, we've gotten uh, rid of, we've eliminated all of the uncertainty. So um, we now have always, we have a yellow light and the yellow light is always followed by reinforcement. 
And if you want to think about an analogy with human gambling behavior, you have um, money in your pocket that you're willing to forego. Um, I, I think in uh, more uh, experimental terms, it might be an opportunity lost to gain uh, reinforcement rather than taking money out of your pocket. Um, the, so uh, again, the question is, what would we get with this procedure? And um, although they're choosing between 50% and 100% reinforcement, remember that the terminal link stimuli predict exactly the same outcome even though the green stimulus occurs only 50% of the time. And the results were quite consistent with that hypothesis, such that um, percentage choice of the suboptimal alternative was essentially 50%. They are indifferent between these two alternatives. Okay. Um, so, Again, to reiterate, because it's such a surprising finding, it's not the probability of winning, but the value of the positive stimulus given that it occurs. And I, uh, in my title, I use gambling as an analogy, and I find that that um, fits human behavior quite well. Um, we have, in the United States, a lottery in fact, there is a national lottery. We have something called Powerball that um, uh, they will often advertise the amount of money you can win if you get all the numbers exactly right. And what I find remarkable about that is they're always advertising that amount and they never tell you about the probability of winning. And so uh, what, is, what I find surprising they sell these tickets at, at gas stations, and um, it used to be that they didn't allow credit cards at gas stations uh, on, at the pump. We now have, you, can, you don't have to go into the little shop there. But when we did have to go in and actually pay or give them a credit card, I was always annoyed by people who were buying lottery tickets, and I always knew when the jackpot um, had gone from only $5 million to $500 million because they were usually long lines of people waiting to buy tickets. So it, it's consistent with this idea that probability of reinforcement seems to play very little role for pigeons as well as for humans, and it's the magnitude of the win that seems to drive the effect. Okay, um, so I just told you about research with this procedure involving 50% versus 100% reinforcement. And we um, ran a study uh, not too long ago in which we were interested in something very different. And I won't even tell you about it because it's a little bit strange of a hypothesis. But in so doing, we ran a control group that was exactly like the group that I just described to you. Um, and as a result of our um, experimental group, which showed very little separation from the control group, we decided to extend training much longer than we had in the earlier experiment. And um, so just to remind you, this is the procedure we used in both experiments, 50% versus 100% reinforcement, but now we extended training for 75 sessions, and now you can see an effect of the difference in the probability of reinforcement, but it occurs not in the direction one would expect. That is, one might expect that with additional training, um, the animals would become sensitive to the probability of reinforcement associated with the initial link. Instead, they actually begin to choose suboptimally, above 50% suboptimally. So um, what, what is surprising is, no, they are not indifferent between the two alternatives. They actually show a significant preference for the suboptimal alternative. Um, this 
just shows what I just said. So the preference for the suboptimal alternative appears to be determined by the predictive value of the colored stimulus and something else. And the reason that I say something else is because um, these things seem to develop differently. So there is uh, an initial effect, which is the green and the yellow stimulus are worth the same amount, but then gradually the green one seems to be worth more over sessions of training. So we hypothesize that it's the difference between what is expected at the start of the trial and what is obtained, that there is an effect of um, positive contrast between expectation and uh, the actual outcome. So another way of describing that is if the animal chooses the optimal alternative, they have learned that reinforcement will follow all the time, and so they expect to get fed, and they always get fed, and that is good. It's good to get fed, especially if you expect to get fed on all the trials. But if on the 50% reinforcement side, they don't expect to get fed on all the trials, and when they get 100% reinforcement, that's even better. It's a surprise. I tell my students that if you uh, expect to get uh, C and you actually get, I don't know if you, maybe I should translate into numbers, we have letter grades, so if you expect to get a 70% and you get an 80%, you're excited and you're very happy. If you expect to get an 80% and you do, that's good, but it's not as good as a student who expected worse. Okay, so that's essentially the idea behind this. Okay, so we suspect that in cases of problem gamblers, that it's this positive contrast that makes gambling so addictive. And in humans, it's more complicated than that even because they can imagine winning and they don't actually have to win. In the case of the pigeons, they have to learn how this works. And so when they do win, um, it provides an additional source of reinforcement. Okay, so um, for the last few minutes, what I would want to, want to do is carry this analogy of gambling behavior a little bit further. And um, looking at some of the gambling literature, we're not very um, familiar with all of it, but some of the things we can see in research on gambling is the, the absence of a positive correlation between how much money you have and how likely you are to gamble. In fact, it tends to be a negative correlation. Now, if you look at that literature, it actually, on the surface, it doesn't make much sense, but it, it really does make a lot of sense, partially at least. That is, um, if you think about winning uh, at gambling um, and the result of that affecting one's life uh, in some way, if you have very little money and you win, it will affect your life in a large way. Whereas if you have a lot of money and you win, it doesn't affect your life very much. So it makes some sense. Uh, in the case of problem gamblers, it doesn't make sense because they end up losing their paycheck and they end up uh, often losing their uh, house. They, they, and very often it leads to um, family problems where they lose their family due to divorce. This happens fairly often. So um, people who tend to have least often gamble the most, at least in terms of if you look at problem gamblers. So our question was, would pigeons do the same? And the analogy with pigeons would be how hungry they are when they enter this experiment. Would they gamble more or less if they are hungrier? And if our hypothesis is correct, then the pigeons that are hungrier will end up gambling and end up getting less food, and the pigeons that are less hungry will get more food. So we used this procedure in which we could look at the slow rate. We, we discovered that if 
there's a 50% chance of reinforcement on the suboptimal side and a reduced only 75% reinforcement on the optimal side. This gives us rather slow acquisition so we can better see differences in um, the manipulation we're making, which is the difference between normally motivated pigeons. Um, when uh, I talk to a veterinarian about uh, the way we deprive our pigeons of food, I'm sure when you use rats you don't have an issue with that, but with pigeons I tend to, and they feel that this is inhumane. And there's this wonderful study in JAB where pigeons were caught in the wild and brought in, given free feed, and they gain about uh, 20 to 25 percent of their normal weight, which is their normal feeding weight in, in nature. Well, I don't know, I don't know how na natural these pigeons live in, but they, they do all right. And so, um, normally motivated pigeons, we generally run our pigeons at 85 percent free feed, but we decided to use a somewhat lower level, which is uh, 80 percent of their free feed weight. Um, and we compared it to pigeons that were less deprived of food, and um, we gradually increased it to the point where they would no longer participate in the experiment and brought it back to a point where they would continue to peck, which turned out to be approximately 92% of free feed weight. So they will continue to peck, they will continue to choose, they're sufficiently motivated but not nearly as motivated as those at 80%. Now, if we look at the, the, the function of training, we can see these are the normally food-restricted birds, and you can see they show what is somewhat typical. Um, they do show this initial uh, preference for the optimal alternative early on. I suspect this is simply before they actually learn to discriminate the colors they appear to um, uh, have acquire information about the value of the two alternatives. But when the conditioned reinforcer, when they learn about the conditioned reinforcer, they show very rapid um, choice of the suboptimal alternative. Now, if we look at the low food restriction animals, we can see that they continue to choose subop uh, optimally below the dotted line, which is 50%. They do seem to be increasing somewhat. Perhaps if we extend the training, they might go higher. But it's quite clear that these two groups are quite different. So a level of motivation, once again, the more motivated the pigeons are, the less food they get. And the, more motiv the less motivated they are, the more food they get, paradoxically. Okay, a second uh, phenomenon that we observed in humans um, is that uh, people who gamble a lot often report very few other interests. That is, they are addicted gamblers and they spend most of their time gambling. Now, um, that is hard to separate. It's hard to separate alternative behaviors from gambling behavior. Um, in the sense that they may just like that behavior a lot. And it's hard to know if there are effective alternatives for the um, humans, um, whether that is just because they don't like any other activities. But what we can do with pigeons is um, give pigeons somewhat uh, behavior that is um, enriched an environment. Now, um, those of you who work with rats um, certainly know the kind of environment that they are housed in in the lab. Um, so uh, what we do is we give them something a little different from their lab environment. Um, and the typical lab environment for pigeons looks something like this. Uh, they have rather small cages. They can see each other across the way. We have pigeons. Uh, they can hear each other. And, um, but they don't have any social interaction, nor do they have room to fly. And we have built cages for them that look like this. And here is an example of five pigeons that are in a cage. Normally we have uh, 
a large container uh, uh, of, of water and one of sand, and we have what you might call toys here, and we have shelves for them to fly up to, and uh, we give them this experience, minimal experience, actually it's four hours a day for five days a week, and uh, in, in, in addition to that, we always give them this experience at the end of their normal um, operant session. So to avoid any carryover effects from whatever this experience is, they're not going to go right into the operant box. They're actually going to go um, the rest of the day and overnight, and then in the next morning they'll get uh, run. So there any uh, temporary transient uh, effects would uh, have dissipated that time. Okay, so let's look at the results. So we have two groups. We have one group that are normally housed. The other group that is essentially normally housed except for this four hours a day, five days a week. And you can see in this particular experiment, um, the pigeons do not show optimal behavior from the beginning that they show very rapid um, uh, preference for the suboptimal alternative in their nat normal cages. In the um, experimental group, the group that has five hours, uh, four hours, five days a week, we find that um, they show some evidence of optimal choice, especially early on for the first uh, 10 sessions or so and then they seem to be attracted to the suboptimal alternative. So the effects are um, not that long lasting. And um, I tell my students that if they're non-gamblers, they shouldn't spend a lot of time around casinos because they're very likely to be attracted to that, um, that it, is, it may not be easy to avoid that kind of um, experience. Um, okay, so we have certain implications of this research, um, and uh, I'm, I'm bringing up gambling behavior in part because um, people who study gambling behavior uh, attribute gambling to certain mechanisms that are very different from pigeons. So um, what the reasons that people who gamble uh, say they are gambling is because it's fun. And uh, as I said before, I don't think that's a very good description of why they gamble. Because uh, when, whenever people say it's not about the money, um, if, you, if you simply uh, gave people who entered the casino a thousand points and you told them, uh, see if you can get more, I don't think people would go to casinos. But um, other researchers have talked about a misunderstanding of the odds. As I said before, uh, no one ever tells you what the odds of winning the lottery might be. Um, well, they might say it's just too complicated. People wouldn't understand the difference between 100,000 to one, a million to one, 100 million to one. Those big numbers are not understandable, and so they don't understand the odds, which may be true. I think in general, people don't understand odds very well. They do understand absolute amounts. In casinos, casino operators have learned that there's some very interesting tools that they use to encourage people to gamble. Um, one of them is, is simply social. People who are gambling, and there are lots of people around who are gambling, they're much more likely to continue gambling because everybody else is doing it. They like that. Uh, the other thing, if you've ever been to a casino, and I have uh, only a couple of times, as purely as a researcher, mind you, um, I notice the slot machines in particular. Um, there may be 200 slot machines in a casino, but if ever anyone wins anything, there are bells and whistles and chimes that go off and lights that flash. And if you're sitting at one of these machines, it sounds like every five or 10 minutes somebody is winning and you feel like it's going to be your turn soon. And so we have this notion of, uh, what is that called? It's, um, um, 
It's the inability to detect change. Um, and the, the idea is that you um, generalize across all these winnings as if it sounds like people are winning all the time, but they're very infrequent because they're 200 machines, perhaps. And then social reinforcement seems to be important. So our feeling is that gambling involves basic behavioral processes. And uh, for some reason that we're really not clear about, we believe that the positive value of rewards are overvalued. I think part of the idea is very strangely, if you think about gambling behavior, because winning is very unlikely in gambling. And so you have an expectation of losing. And for that reason, when you lose, it doesn't inhibit gambling. But if you win, there is a huge positive contrast and what gamblers would call elation, uh, the emotion that occurs when you win. And so the negative value of losses are also undervalued. And then this secondary reinforcement, if you will, um, winning has additional value relative to expectation. That is, it, it's not just the value of winning, but the value of winning relative to your expectation. Now, um, when I talk to psychologists in my department about this, they often ask me, is there any value to your research for um, human, treating human gambling? And I point to the potential treatment of problem gambling with enriched environments. I don't know. We do have a group called Gamblers Anonymous, and um, I, I, I would like to talk to them about um, something perhaps as simple as having them all join the Sierra Club or some kind of organization that goes out camping or hiking or doing something that might be equally, well, maybe not equally, but may be a substitute of reinforcement for them. And I would like to thank my collaborators on this, and I'm certainly willing to uh, answer any questions you might have, or try to. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. We have time for. Eh, tenemos tiempo para un par de preguntas. very nice to have a microphone that doesn't work. <laughs> this one does work. Okay. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, this interesting talk about a, a very interesting topic. And I was thinking that uh, when a gambler doesn't hit the jackpot, we usually use the, 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 the expression that he didn't win. Like, m much, uh, much like the pigeon that is stuck in a um, zero percent yes. uh, trial. But in the case of the gambler, he, he, he doesn't just not win, he actually loses. Because he spent money on that lotto ticket or a slot yes. machine or something like that. So I was wondering if you have uh, done any research in which there is an explicit penalty involved in the suboptimal choice and what would happen in, on that, under those no, circumstances? There, there, there isn't. And uh, I've imagined um, putting pockets on the pigeons so that I could give it some grain, but it would to invest. But uh, I think practically speaking, that would be difficult. Um, if you're talking about something aversive occurring? Uh, yeah, maybe. I was thinking like two, the, I, I think that there's two basic options. One of, uh, one, which w one would be like the classical timeout situation or something like that. But it would maybe mo be more interesting that if you're stuck with a 0% yes. probability, it, it doesn't only affect the probability of reinforcement in that trial, but it actually reduces... As a penalty. Yeah, as a so penalty, it reduces the probability of reinforcement in future trials. Like, you're lo losing uh, potential reinforcement that you could have earned if you hadn't cho chosen that option. Okay, so maybe. one alternative would be to in, in, impose a timeout. 
And uh, what we found is that timeouts don't seem to affect pigeons the way they do rats. And uh, that is, it's almost as if because of the context, which is very visual for the pigeon, um, the timeout period is viewed as a different context. And so not as a penalty, as simply, you know, you take a break from gambling, essentially like that. They don't make that association. Now, there might be a way to encourage them to learn that there is a consequence to getting it wrong, to, to losing, the way people do because they actually lose money. So I, I think you're absolutely right that they, it would be good to look at that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, very nice uh, talk. And also thinking this uh, sort of uh, procedural uh, designs that you may uh, put in work in order to maybe find these uh, applied implications. I was wondering, have you thought of uh, playing with this uh, expectancy? Uh, I don't know, like factor of the phenomenon, but thinking in not. Uh, maybe decreasing the uh, negative expectance with the reinforcer that makes it like very, very salient, but also somehow making uh, also very negative uh, uh, the fact that they don't get the actual reinforcement that, I don't know, maybe like giving uh, free reinforcers or something in order to, you know, like also uh, contrasting it with the times that they don't get the reinforcement, and in that sense, making that uh, also like a very negative uh, result, and maybe you know affecting this uh, bias in the choice behavior. I'm not sure I understand, but uh, I think the mechanism why why don't you get neg why don't we get negative contrast exactly. with the pigeons? And I think it's because of the expectation. And if you think about an expectation generally of losing, then when they lose, there's no negative contrast. Even though there should be, there isn't. Yeah, that's, that's the thing that maybe so, if you have thought of any way of actually generating this negative, negative contrast. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure we could have something more negative, uh, a puff of air. We could have a small shock or something like that. Yeah. Um, pigeons don't work very well in the context of shock, but. Um, something that might be uh, not as, well, not getting fed, this lost opportunity should be very effective because it's only on the suboptimal side that they fail to get food. The optimal side, under some conditions, at least the last ones, where it's 100% reinforcement or three pellets, they always get fed. So there's something that doesn't, inhibit the animal from choosing the suboptimal alternative that not getting fed doesn't do it. So you have to do something. But the question is, what, what is it that you could do that wouldn't introduce another negative, some kind of negative event, and, um, and also doesn't interfere with the animal's choice? If, if the animal actually experiences a shock or experiences something that's aversive, yes, it might it might uh, choose the optimal alternative, but I'm not sure what that would mean in terms of, I mean, you can certainly find something that would inhibit that response. And so I'm just, if you think about something, let me know. I'd be glad to <laughs> try it in some way, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, and I want to say thank you for you being here. And I wonder if there are any studies with this kind of um, design, but with other species, like um, yes. I mean, um, rats or even humans? Yes, right. Um, we have an expert on looking at gambling behavior in rats, and uh, he and I have had a very lively discussion about the conditions under which one can get it in rats. It turns out that under conditions that pigeons show it, 
rats generally don't. And um, then the question is, are the uh, um, contexts similar? And the, it turns out we can find, Vladimir has shown and we have shown that there are contexts you have, you get into the salience of the stimulus um, and the other, that is, you need certain kinds of salience to get the effect in rats. Pigeons show this effect. Uh, it seems to be related to sign tracking, if you're familiar with that. Pigeons are very good sign trackers. Rats, not so much. And so those animals that tend to sign track will very often show these effects. Um, also, the, in all of this research I've described here, the discriminative stimuli are on for 10 seconds. There's nothing special about 10 seconds. We just happen to use it and it works. But it turns out with rats, um, 10 seconds isn't the best. If you extend that duration longer, you get um, better effects. So those are the only two non-human species that we've used for these procedures. Okay. And they both show it. Pigeons show it much more readily. I think it's also because they tend to be very impulsive. Rats are impulsive as well, but not as impulsive as pigeons are. So pigeons are a very good model for looking at this kind of behavior. But I'm guessing that one can find procedures that would show it in other species as well. Okay? Thank By you. the way, if any of you are reluctant to ask me questions in English because you don't feel your English is good enough, I'm sure Vladimir would be glad to try to translate it so you don't have to feel um, se uh, self-conscious. I can understand that perfectly. Well, uh, thank you. Well, uh, Sinka uh, wants to thank you for your talk and for your presence in this meeting, and wants to give you this small presence with the objective that you do not forget that you and your research are highly appreciated in Mexico. Bien, eh, a continuación daremos inicio a la ceremonia de clausura de este evento y le doy la palabra. Doctor Héctor Martínez. 